Hello and welcome to the EMA's Knowledge Series. On today's edition, the Environmental Management Authority presents reports on two significant areas of direct impact on the environment in Trinidad and Tobago. We begin with a presentation on the Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Network and the Air Quality Index. Good day and welcome. My name is Suan Ramnarain and I am a technical officer in the air unit of the EME. Today, I will be presenting on the Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Network and the Air Quality Index. On your screen is a picture taken by an EME employee in the month of June, which illustrates the impacts of Saharan dust on air quality in the polar spin area. The dark haze scene that reduces visibility is not due to rain clouds, but is a result of the dust in the air. In fact, you may recall that for the month of June 2020, social media and mainstream media was abuzz with the words Saharan dust, air quality, and air quality index. Some may be familiar with those terms, but others may be wondering, what is an air quality index, and how is this index developed? Firstly, there must be an ambient air quality monitoring network. The network consists of stations across Trinidad and Tobago. Each station containing equipment which measures pollution concentrations in ambient air. The equipment draws and samples outdoor breathable air to measure pollutant concentrations. The two photographs to the right show the air quality equipment that formed the network. The photograph on the left shows the equipment set up in Tobago and the photograph on the right shows the equipment set up in Trinidad. Though both setups are different in configuration, the analyzers within these stations and methodologies used are based on the same operating principles. All equipment and methods are internationally recognized, designated and equivalent methods. Six criteria air pollutants are measured at each station. Criteria pollutants are the most common air pollutants found in the atmosphere as a result of man-made activities. They are the most common byproduct of transportation and industrial activities that produce acute effects on human health. The air pollutants measured are particulate matter of diameter less than or equal to 10 micrometers and less than or equal to 2.5 micrometers, commonly referred to as PM10 and PM2.5. Particulate matter of very fine particles. To put this into perspective, the diagram on the right uses a strand of human hair to illustrate the two particulate matter sizes. Each blue dot shows the size of particulate matter less than or equal to 10 micrometers and each red dot shows the size of particulate matter less than or equal to 2.5 micrometers. It can be seen that PM10 can fit into a strand of hair five times and PM2.5 25 times. Also think about a grain of sand on a beach. A grain of sand is nine times larger than PM10. These particulate matter sizes can get into your lungs. Other air pollutants measured are sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone. Currently, there are four stations in the network, three in Trinidad and one in Tobago. In Trinidad, they are located in North Trinidad at the Wasser Wastewater Treatment Plant off the Beatum Highway. In Central Trinidad at the Point Lisas Industrial Estate, and in South Trinidad at the Southern Academy for the Performing Arts. In Tobago, it is located at Signal Hill. Over the next year, two stations will be added to the network, one in Arima and the other in Southwest Trinidad. Having a network has many other benefits. It allows us to assess the extent of air pollution, it provides information on air quality trends and air quality indices. It provides data for use in air quality models, and it supports the revision of air quality standards. For example, Schedule 1 of the air pollution rules sets maximum permissible levels for ambient air. 
By having this network, it will allow us to revise these standards in the future. Other benefits include, it allows for the evaluation of the effectiveness of emission control strategies. It allows for the conduct of impact assessments of source categories. It allows for an evaluation of the effectiveness or impacts of land use planning on air quality. It provides real-time air pollution data to the general public and it supports research. An air quality index or AQI as it is commonly called is a number for reporting daily air quality. It tells you how clean or polluted the air is and the associated health effects. We can think of the AQI as a measuring stick or a scale that has values from 0 to 500. The higher the value on that scale, the greater the air pollution and greater the health impact. The key benefit of using an AQI is the ability to present air quality data in a format that is easily understood and accessed by the general public, so they are informed and able to take appropriate actions to protect their health and the health of their families. The AQI is scaled and color-coded, so there is no need to understand units like micrograms per meter cube and concentrations. So the air pollutants measured using air quality equipment within the ambient air quality monitoring network automatically measures and records the concentration or levels of pollutants in the air. The air quality index or AQI software then converts the concentration of the pollutant into a number on a scale of 0 to 500. The image on your right shows the scale. Notice that it is color coded also. Notice the graphic on the right. The AQI values are characterized by the level of the health concern with each category assigned a color. The AQI uses colors that persons are familiar with, such as green, yellow, and red. Many persons associate green with go, yellow with caution, and red with stop. So an AQI value in the range of 1 to 50 is color-coded green, meaning that air quality is good and everyone can go about their personal affairs without cause for concern. However, as the AQI value goes over 50 and approaches 100, the color changes to yellow. Because although air quality is acceptable, those who are highly sensitive can begin to experience health effects. Highly sensitive individuals can include the elderly, young children, persons with respiratory illnesses, those that suffer from heart ailments, and those with a compromised immune system. Generally, the 100 mark on the AQI scale represents the air quality standard. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have the Air Pollution Rules 2014, which sets standards for acceptable air quality. When the AQI goes over 100, we enter the unhealthy zone because it means that air pollution has exceeded the acceptable standard. So a numerical value of 151 to 200 is color-coded red because everyone may begin to experience health effects and those that are part of the sensitive group may experience more serious health effects. The last category is color-coded dark purple and means that hazardous conditions exist that can be deemed an air quality emergency. To help you understand the connection between the concentration of pollution and the AQI value, on your screen is the AQI value and the concentration of pollution for particulate matter or very fine dust for June 21st, 2020. On June 21st, 2020, the EMA recorded the highest concentration of particulate matter since we started monitoring. The concentration of very fine dust represented by PM10, meaning particulate matter that is less than 10 micrometers in the air, was 294 micrograms per meter cube. To put this into context, the acceptable standard for this pollutant is 75 microgram per meter cube. So on June 21st, 2020, at the Air Quality Monitoring Station in Tobago, we measured a concentration of dust in the air that was almost four times the acceptable limit. 
This corresponded to an AQI value of 485, color-coded dark purple, representing hazardous conditions. This historical event was directly related to Saharan dust. As the AQI increases, the level of health concerns will change. The higher the AQI, the greater the level of health concern. Sensitive and unusually sensitive persons may be affected, for example, babies, the elderly, and persons with pre-existing health conditions, for example, persons with respiratory ailments. If you see that the AQI is unhealthy or hazardous, stay indoors, Avoid exercising or working outdoors for long periods. Choose less strenuous outdoor activities. Postpone outdoor recreational and non-mandatory activities. The Air Quality Index can be accessed by the general public through the Air Quality Management Information System website. This website is accessed from the EMA's website www.ema.co.tt. I would now like to share with you a short demonstration on how to access the AQMIS website and a brief explanation of the various features of the dashboard and how to use the dashboard to acquire the pertinent information. Firstly, you open your browser and you type in the address www.ema.co.tt. This then brings you to the EMA's homepage. Under our environment air, you will then find the air quality index. Scroll down to access the AQI dashboard. This will then bring you to the main dashboard page. As you can see, it indicates that the air quality index is a number used by agencies to communicate to the public how polluted the air currently is or forecasted to be. The air quality index consists of six colors increasing by the level of health concern. For example, if the AQI is 0 to 50, it means that the air quality is good, as opposed to if the air quality index is 201 to 300, then it means the air quality is very unhealthy. If you scroll down, you will see the monitoring stations at each of the locations that are currently in the network. This includes Point Lisas, Port of Spain, and San Fernando. Looking at Point Lisas as an example, you can see that today, on March 31st, the AQI is currently good and recorded at 23. The AQI represented here is for particulate matter of diameter 10. As you can see on the right, it says who should be worried, no one, everyone is safe. What should I do? Enjoy your outdoor activities. If you click on health effects, for each of the air pollutants that's monitored in the system, you will get the respective AQI score, who should be worried, and what you should do. By clicking on the last 24 hours chart, you get the AQI for the last 24 hours. Likewise, for the grid, you get the AQI by air pollutant. This also allows you to go back historically and determine what the AQI may have been for a previous day. By clicking on historical, you would see the AQI previously for previous days. So if I wanted to know the AQI for the 10th of March 2021, I simply put in the year, month, and day. The AQI would refresh, and you can see that it would have been 21 for particulate matter. If you were to scroll down, you would see Port of Spain currently has an AQI that is moderate at 55. San Fernando is also good at 42. Moving along on the tabs of the dashboard, if you were to click on monitoring, you would see for the various monitoring stations, the period average concentrations for the last 24 hours by air pollutant. So for example, CO, 
this graph shows what the concentration of carbon monoxide would be at the San Fernando Point Lisas and Port of Spain stations. As you scroll down, you would get hourly concentrations by air pollutants and you would get wind roses showing the wind direction at the time. As you can see, the wind direction is mostly from the east. By clicking on monitoring stations, using Point Lisa as an example, you would get graphs showing the concentrations by air pollutant for the last 24 hours. Currently, this shows CO. If I was to change the air pollutant to PM10, the graph would refresh and I would see the PM concentrations for the last 24 hours. If you're interested in more information, the FAQs has a variety of questions with the respective answers on the network and the air quality index. And as of general information, by clicking on map, you can see all the locations of the stations in Trinidad and Tobago. This is the end of our demonstration. When there are extreme air events, for example on days with Saharan dust, the public is informed of the Air Quality Index via the EMA's website and social media platforms. So you would have noticed over the last few days, the Air Quality Index would have been updated through Instagram. The public is also informed through mainstream media, television, radio, and newspaper. This brings us to the end of the presentation. Following this, if you have any further questions on the Ambient Air Quality Network, or the Air Quality Index, you can contact the EME's office at 226-4-EME, that is 226-4362, extension 3202. You can also send us an email at air at ema.co.tt. Thank you for participating today. Thanks to the EMA's air unit for that presentation. Here's a reminder of two public surveys currently underway. The Environmental Management Authority is collecting feedback on our interaction with stakeholders for the period June 2020 to September 2021. We invite you as a valuable stakeholder to complete a survey on customer satisfaction and communication, which will take approximately five minutes. Visit the EMA's website or social media pages for the link to participate. The Environmental Management Authority is in the process of mainstreaming the National Environmental Policy NEP 2018 with interest in evolving a greener economy. This initiative seeks to focus on the business community of Trinidad and Tobago, where we intend to determine the business sector's knowledge on and interest in greening the economy through an online survey. To participate, visit the EMA's website at www.ema.co.tt or the EMA's social media pages, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram. The following is the baseline ecological risk assessment for the southwest peninsula of Trinidad, point of pair to Icarcus. The Gulf of Paria historically has been used for upstream oil and gas activities, fishing, recreation, as well as a main transportation trade route. It is the receiving environment for marine and land-based discharges from industrial, agricultural, commercial and domestic sources. The water quality of the Gulf of Paria is strongly influenced by the nutrient inputs from the Orinoco and Amazon rivers, which contribute to its high fisheries productivity. Several communities along the southwestern coastline 
depend on the Gulf of Paria for their livelihoods from socio-economic activities such as fishing, crab catching, and oyster catching. During the recent years, there has been an increase in the frequency of oil spill incidences in the Gulf of Paria that may have originated from onshore and or offshore oil and gas activities. There have been many concerns raised by the public on the direct effects of oil spills on the receiving physical, biological and socio-economic environment as well as the use of dispersants to treat oil in the marine environment along the southwestern coastline of the Gulf of Paria. Based on the expressed public concerns, the Environmental Management Authority, the EMA, procured the services of CSA Ocean Sciences Trinidad Limited CSA in partnership with international experts Howell, Gentile and Associates HGA, a United States-based consulting firm with extensive experience and expertise in ecological risk assessments to conduct a baseline ecological risk assessment study along the southwest peninsula of Trinidad. This study was conducted in accordance with the 1998 guidelines for ecological risk assessment from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which describe an ERA as the process that evaluates the likelihood that adverse ecological effects may occur or are occurring as a result of exposure to one or more stressors. The study commenced in April 2018 with the aim of identifying the risks posed by chemical contaminants to ecological receptors within the defined study area based on the sources of contamination to the Gulf of Paria and to provide recommendations for the remedial actions for each ecological risk deemed to be significant or unacceptable. The study area extended from the high water mark from Point Pier to Ikakas along the southwestern coast of Trinidad to a 5.56 km or 3 nautical mile offshore area in the Gulf of Paria. According to the 1998 U.S. EPA guidelines, the three primary phases of any ERA are problem formulation, analysis, and risk characterization. During the problem formulation phase, data is collected and the project objectives are refined in consideration of the chemicals of potential concern, fate and transport of contaminants, and ecosystems at risk. The analysis phase characterizes the contaminant stressor exposure and ecological effects on the ecosystems, and this information is evaluated to estimate the exposure and effects of risks involved during risk characterization. The information and data are then communicated to the risk manager to recommend and implement management measures to remediate the unacceptable risks. In order to determine the chemicals of potential concern and ecological receptors at risk, environmental baseline surveys were conducted in August of 2018, the wet season, and May 2019, the dry season. The four regional areas of interest or strata within the study area were onshore riverine, intertidal, nearshore 0 to 1.5 nautical miles, and offshore 1.5 to 3 nautical miles. The rivers selected for onshore sampling were the Guaracara, Sepero, Godino, Guapo, and Iroy rivers. Each river was considered as a point source into the Gulf of Paria. These surveys included collection of water, sediment, and faunal samples at the four strata to establish the existing baseline and determine the current state of the environment in the study area against which ecological risk to biological resources and human health could be assessed. This study excluded the use and analysis of dispersants such as Corexit used in the cleanup activity of oil spills, 
Since studies on dioctyl sodium sulfosusinate, the active ingredient of the dispersant corexit, suggest a rapid uptake and elimination of dioctyl sodium sulfosusinate from the environment. In January 2019, the Conceptual Ecosystem Model Workshop was hosted by CSA, HGA, and the EMA, with expert participants from varying regulatory government agencies and non-governmental organizations with local knowledge on fisheries, water quality, coastal ecology, spill management, and environmental management of the Gulf of Paria. At this workshop, the Trinidad Gulf of Paria Conceptual Ecosystem Model was developed. Major stressors were qualitatively ranked with respect to ecological risks to inform the screening level ERA, which is a qualitative aspect of the ecological risk assessment. It estimates the likelihood that a particular risk exists, identifies the need for site-specific data collection, and focuses site-specific ecological risk assessments where necessary. Oil spills were ranked as a high risk to the Gulf of Paria based on the increase in significant oil spills in recent history as they produce a suite of specific stressors that affect ecological components during the immediate, intermediate and long-term period following the spill. Other stressors such as climate change, overfishing and habitat alteration were also ranked as high but were not considered under the scope of this study. In consideration of the findings of the Environmental Baseline Surveys and Conceptual Ecosystem Model Workshop, there was a change in the approach to the baseline ERA study from a reactive remedial process to a proactive preventative process in which potential chemical pollution events were quantitatively assessed to identify the ecological risk from such events and to recommend preventative and recovery measures to manage the risk and minimize the effects on ecological resources and, by extension, human health. This approach incorporated a scenario consequence analysis which was used to determine the fate and transport of chemicals of potential concern, identify exposure pathways, valued ecosystem components potentially at risk, and the appropriate site-specific ecological endpoints for assessing risk from selected stressors. Several potential scenarios were modeled for oil and chemical spills for products produced and shipped within the southwest of the Gulf of Paria. These scenarios considered the fate and transport of oil and chemical spills under the influence of various wind conditions using the Marine Chemical and Oil Spill Model, which was developed by HGA and designed to simulate the fate and transport of an oil or chemical spill from any given location in the marine environment. The key ecological resources of concern were mangroves, tidal flats, sea turtles, seagrass communities, wading and coastal birds, fish, shellfish, fisheries, and recreational beaches. The risks from these potential spills and consequences on ecological resources were quantified in the scenario consequence analysis. It was determined that winds could potentially transport an oil spill anywhere in the Gulf of Paria, placing the entire coastline at risk. Based on the results of the scenario consequence analysis, risks from an oil spill would have the most potentially catastrophic ecological consequences, particularly on coastal ecosystems such as mangroves ecosystems. Further, the marine chemical and oil spill model was field validated when the modeled output from a potential oil spill influenced by the east-northeast trade wind was consistent with the previous oil spill of December 2013. In June 2020, CSA, HGA and the EMA 
hosted a virtual presentation to brief stakeholders, including government and non-government agencies, on the findings of the baseline ERA study, which included the following conclusions and recommendations. The study area is a stressed environment with polluted rivers, especially the Guaracara River and the Sapero River discharging into the Gulf of Paria. Data from the baseline seasonal surveys were generally comparable to previous studies. The polyaromatic hydrocarbon concentrations in sediment and megafauna samples were relatively low. However, elevated levels of total extractable hydrocarbon were found in sediment at several stations and in faunal samples, while high concentrations of sediment metals were also found at some stations, but not at toxic effects levels. Copper and zinc concentrations were elevated in invertebrates. Further studies are required to investigate these concerns. The greatest ecological risk to the Gulf of Paria is from a major spill of crude oil, especially from a shipping accident with the direct effects of oiling dominating the ecologically significant effects of an oil spill. Mangroves and mangrove ecosystems are particularly vulnerable to oil and can be significantly affected by crude oil spills. A major spill of crude oil could constitute a catastrophic disaster for Trinidad mangrove ecosystems in the Gulf of Paria, from which they would not readily recover. Coastal and marine birds, including the scarlet ibis and dozens of other species of wading and coastal birds in mangroves, tidal flats and beaches, are greatly at risk to oiling. Wind speed and direction during an oil spill event control the movement of the oil slick. This means that depending on the winds following an oil spill, the entire Trinidad Gulf of Paria coastline is at risk. There will be no bioconcentration or trophic level effects on fish from the toxic chemicals such as hydrocarbons in crude oil. The ability of fishes and other vertebrates such as birds to metabolize these chemicals when present in their systems leads to decreases in concentrations or trophic dilution higher up the food chain. No major or direct fish scales are expected from crude oil spills based on experience with hundreds of marine spills. This is because of limited co-occurrence that is prolonged presence within a toxic effects zone of fish with oil on the surface and or with the dissolved toxic hydrocarbon components, which is in part due to active avoidance by adult fish. There will be no population level effects on fish from the oil spill scenarios examined. There could be societally significant effects from oiling such as impacts to tourism, fisheries closures, example because of tainting of seafood, beach closures, tar balls on beaches, and oiling effects on industrial operations. No ecologically significant effects from any of the major chemical spill scenarios on the Gulf of Paria ecosystems. These chemicals were less toxic than crude oil and may have a shorter longevity in seawater. In addition, the following are proposed recommendations for future works. Pre-deploy oil containment systems such as booms around vulnerable ecological resources such as the Karani Swamp and the Godino Swamp. Installation of automated oil spill detection and containment systems to facilitate real-time detection and early spill response actions at high-risk locations of previous oil spills. The development and implementation of a monitoring program for select Gulf of Paria environmental resources to include water, sediment and fauna samples to assess parameter concentrations, temporal changes and natural variability. The conduct of focused studies on particular resources 
Example, selected commercial species in collaboration with other research institutions such as the Institute of Marine Affairs to better understand trends of potential contaminants of concern within the same trophic levels and upper trophic levels. And an in-depth monitoring study of the riverine systems and potential point sources that discharge into the Gulf of Paria. For further information on the baseline ecological risk assessment for the southwest peninsula of Trinidad, point appear to ECARCAS, visit the Environmental Management Authority's website at www.ema.co.tt.